So interested in looking at uh, uh, funding for 1890s versus 1862s, um, this was out of a conversation that we've had amongst ourselves and thinking about how is it, what are the differences between these institutions? And we do know that there's a long history of differential funding for these schools, um, but there is sort of two ways of thinking about this funding. There's one that is um, the state match that the federal government gives through um, uh, a formula fund program, which is a significant part of the funding for 1890s and 1862s. But then there is the competitive grant world. Um, NIFA offers competitive grants. Um, and the question is, are those are, are opportunities similar across those institution types? And so um, we know that funding is important as, as Tim made very clear, it's the lifeblood and it really does have an important um, control or implication for what is taught, what research is conducted and, and who, you, who the university or the, the unit reaches out to. Okay, um, and then given that um, the ref request for applications, the things that kind of shape how um, applications look or the ones that are actually submitted as proposals, um, they really do shape you know, what research questions are asked and which authors get published and which students receive training. I mean, funding, um, grant funding can significantly influence all of these aspects of how uh, an academic is able to do their job and who they're able to reach because of that funding. So what we wanted to do was actually understand this differential funding between 1890s and 1862s. Now, I've got to be very clear, there are differences in these two institutions um, in their stakeholders and just the number and size of these institutions. So one of the things as I look at or as we show some of these differences, I want us to keep that in mind. We shouldn't expect there to be a one-to-one -one match because these are different schools, but there are some ways of looking at differences across these inst institution types that I do believe leaves us with a compelling case that there has been something different in the funding uh, streams. So why focus on competitive grants? Um, you could argue, especially with land grants where there is formula funding and there's a fixed amount of money from Hatch or um, Evans Allen where there's just a bucket of money. But the, the, the competitive grant world actually opens up other opportunities. It allows researchers to be creative it allows their ideas to be vetted between other researchers to, to actually see in the, in, the, in the ideal, good ideas rise to the top and get supported. Um, and competitive funds are getting, becoming more and more important as we think about tenure and prom promotion um, at different institutions. And the reality is state and federal funding is not increasing. Um, in the way that allows, uh, in terms of the, the, the formula fund, so the competitive grant work can be really important. So uh, how this research is funded, there's been a lot of research done in the world of how funds are, done, are, are sort of developed and distributed. Um, and so we know with USDA funding, there are competitive uh, grants, as I've mentioned before, and the formula funds I've also talked about. And then there are these sort of special awards, uh, congressionally awarded or contracts and grants. Um, Economic Research Service has a um, um, cooperative agreement, and so does the office, the office of the Chief Economist. There are these opportunities to work with universities, with faculty, to actually provide them money to, to address a particular problem. We also know that states differ widely in the degree to which uh, they're dependent on this funding. And in this competitive grant world, um, there are some differences in how big that is, um, but it's a real focus on basic research. And by basic, I'm not necessarily talking about this esoteric research, but not necessarily always the most applied um, work can be funded. Um, and they're not state focused. Um, and this is a, a really important thing um, in preparing for this. Um, I read, uh, there was a time back in the 90s um, and early 2000s where there was some real um, pressure on the formula funding stream um, under the Bush administration. And, and there were a number of back economists who actually wrote about this and were very concerned. There was pieces and choices and there were, um, um, mm -hmm. I think, AE, what would have been AEPP um, mm -hmm. articles about this. And one of the things that came out of that discussion was if we don't receive the formula funding or if we see cuts in it, that means research that may not be competitive, if you will, um, in a grants program might get, might lose out on it. So if you're interested in 
the real concerns of the state. If you're interested in stakeholders within the state, then formula funds are really important. And thus the competitive grant world is considered maybe not ideal. So this land grant, um, the land grant system as I've already kind of hinted at and talked about earlier, um, really was established to provide this funding um, and in terms of teaching. Um, and we know about the 1862 um, distinction. And um, I realized that I did not know exactly all of the, um, the land grant institutions. I mean, we know every state has a land grant um, an 1862 land grant, but there were these outlying territories. So Puerto Rico, Guam, um, Marshall Islands, and some of these places I didn't really know existed. So this is important to know that this land grant structure actually goes into um, in some places that we may not have always thought about. And then the 1890s, uh, of course, as we've talked about are um, historically black land grant universities. They're mostly in the South. There are a few that are exceptions. Tuskegee is its own kind of unique situation. Um, they are subsumed into the land grant um, system because some of the original ideas of extension come out of Tuskegee University. Well, uh, Ohio has a land, uh, 18, six, excuse me, 1899. They also have an 1862. But um, uh, Central State University actually became a land grant in the last five years. So I didn't even realize, I had assumed for you that they had always been, and they had functioned in many ways like a land grant, but they were outside of the system. So, and then, um, and I didn't talk about this earlier, but it's important to note that there have been uh, sort of a, an expansion of the land grant mission into other institutions. So now we have the tribal colleges um, and universities have uh, 1990 or 1994 land grants. And there's also an effort for historically his, um, Hispanic serving institutions. So when we think about the 1890, 1862 divide, and I will just focus on that divide. I'm, I realize that there are 1994s in the Hispanic serving institutions, but when you look at the numbers, you're looking at a rough breakdown of about 25% of the land grants, 1890, 1862, 25% are 1890 institutions and 75% are 1862s. And that distinction is important because Again, if we were to look at aggregate funding that comes out of NIFA for uh, competitive grants, we should not expect to see um, just sort of an equal split between those. And the question is, is even a 25, 75% split appropriate? And I'm not trying to put a value judgment, but I'm just aware that there can be some differences there. If we look at where the 1890s are, we see again, like I said, uh, they're mostly in the South. Um, again, I've seen these maps in different times and you will see that Ohio is not included. Sometimes it's included depending on the year that you're looking at. Um, I won't go through all of the examples of the different pieces of legislation that have supported the land grant mission, both at 1890 and 1862 institutions, but suffice it to say that they were oriented to create the land grant, to create uh, the experiment station and to create the um, uh, the, um, ex uh, the experiment station and the cooperative extension system. And it's also important to note that other activities are, have been supported like forestry um, and veterinary medicine. Um, so uh, this may be a little bit hard to see. This came from um, a, a CRS a Congressional um, a Service Report. Um, to look at the land grant system. There have been a couple of those in the last, uh, last four or five years, looking at basically the disparities of the land grant system in terms of 1890s versus 1862s. And this is just a graphic of the distribution of funds. So the, um, I have to get my directions right. The far left is a uh, discretionary budget and it leads to some of the capacity building grants. And it, it took me a while to understand the capacity building grants are basically the formula funds that states are, that the federal government guarantee, guarantees, excuse me, and that states are supposed to match. Um, there's some really complicated rules about how states match that money. And when I was a faculty member at Auburn, I remember hearing a lot about that. And then in recent years, we've been hearing how 1890s have not necessarily received a match. And there have been some real problems with that um, at the state level. So the federal government may have given the, the opportunity for the money to go, but if the match didn't occur, some of the money may not have appeared is the way I've understood it. So I'd be happy if someone corrects me if I've misunderstood that. <laughs> 
Um, and when we look at the 2020 fiscal year, we can see the split was a little bit um, fairly even, but competitive grants receive a little bit more of that funding. Um, and I've already talked about uh, this kind of funding where we see what the research, Hatch, have Evans Allen, McSire, um, McIntyre, Stennis, and Animal Health for veterinary schools. Um, and we can see the split 21% went to 1890s and 79% went to 1862s. So kind of close to the 75, 25 split we talked about. And then we talk about the extension of different programs and we see the split is a little bit um, less towards that 75, 25. When we look at the competitive grants, the biggest bulk of that money is gonna be 79% is going to be in what are competitive research grants. So that's the AFRI program, the Ag Food Research Initiative, um, used to be NRI, if you're old enough to remember that. The Higher Education Challenge Grant, there's some competitive extension, and then there are integrated programs, which require extension and research or extension and teaching or um, some combination of the three. But of this $64 billion, uh, excuse me, million dollars, 79, almost 80% of it is going to competitive grants, I mean, or going to these kinds of research grants. There are a couple of smaller programs which even though on the surface they're smaller in terms of the full competitive uh, bucket, they're actually fairly large grants, especially the special crop research grant. Um, um, and so it's, it's some differences in that. Um, NIFA's agenda, I think it's also important to think about how a funder provides funding. They set an agenda. They have sets of questions and issues that they think are important and they create this agenda to um, direct the research in particular paths. Even though researchers are free to do whatever they want or submit whatever they want, I should say, and this is different than when we talk about the formula funds, there is an agenda that NIFA sets and there's, um, and this agenda comes from basically directives that come out of the farm bill and there's stakeholder input. And um, Robin Shoemaker, who's one of the authors of this paper, was talking about the importance of stakeholders and shaping um, issues, especially as it dealt with a particular issue around water and production. Now, these program uh, leaders, they actually have to synthesize a lot of this information, and they're the ones who write the um, requests for applications, the RFAs. And what can influence that is how well these individuals are hearing from stakeholders um, and how these institutions um, um, uh, serve these different stakeholders, how that information is included. You know, there's some questions about who actually is at the table when these RFAs are developed and when these stakeholder meetings are occurring. If they are not diverse, then are we hearing from all folks in that way? Um, what innovations are not explored if small and minority farmers are not included in the process is one of the questions. And there have been some um, conversations around, you know, what is this peer review process? Is it equitable? So these are competitive grants, and these grants are decided by a, a panel of, of peers. These are supposed to be individuals who are in similar situation, and they evaluate your, your proposal to make a determination. And the question is, um, how representative are these panels? And even when they are representative, how, how well do they appreciate the work of another um, person? Um, writing competitive grants are, uh, writing competitive grants, excuse me, is a tr difficult process. Uh, reviewers have uh, a very little time to review these um, packets. There's a lot of information that they have to synthesize. And so you can imagine that there can be challenges in um, how this process is conducted. Now, I will say these panels, uh, the, there have been a lot of, there have been a lot of thought about how we do these panels and trying to make sure that they're equitable, but we're humans and things um, do fall through. And so part of the, the, the point in thinking about this process is, you know, we know that there are diverse perspectives and um, there can be biases that are brought in. So it's important to think about who gets to help set the agenda and who gets to help decide who wins uh, these grants. Now, I will tell you a real brief point. Um, there is a huge literature in the world of NIH, the National Institute, Institutes of Health, which funds um, health research. Um, and there is also a growing literature in the National Science Foundation world where they've been thinking about what is going on when we actually ask and put out RFAs and are these processes fair? Are they 
uh, equitable. And so some of this work, and this is particularly out of NIH, shows that there's some differentials when we look at black versus white applicants. Um, and even with similar records, the likelihood of winning a grant can be differential. And we see that this really has some important implications in terms of both who the applicant is and what they do. So black applicants publish the same number of papers during their PhD and postdoc trainings, but they were less likely to receive citations. And this is an important point because citations can be, is considered an indicator of quality. And therefore, if your, your citation count looks off, you're less likely to be successful. Black applicants reported fewer applications, um, fewer citations and published in journals with lower impact factors. Um, and these are uh, contributing factors to this differential. Um, and then publications um, explain half of the black-white funding gap. So even with differences, we can see that the publication count didn't seem to matter as much. Um, for award experienced investigator, black applicants were awarded half the grants of their white counterparts. Um, black applicants are twice as likely to be new applicants um, and then black applicants. And so th therefore less likely to be successful because it's typically the case you have to apply multiple times in order to receive funding. And black applicants were significantly less likely to be employed by a top 100 NIH institution. An institutional type and institutional standing can have some influence. So we know this, and, and there are some um, even differences, not just in the black-white divide, but also when we talk about black and even Asian um, applicants are less likely to be rewarded. The top award in NIH funding is an R01 on their first or second attempt. I'm going to um, move on to talking about something we did um, and some data that we collected. So working with um, uh, NIFA, the, they have a public database called Data Gateway. I um, mean, my point is just to try to talk a little bit about the differential in this funding, looking specifically at, um, at NIFA. And one of the things that this database provides is basically all of the awards that were awarded over um, I, I can't remember the earliest year, but we are looking at data as early as 2010. And they provide you with some information in terms of the name, the university that was public, where the university and information about the, the application, almost like an abstract of sorts. The interesting thing about that database is it doesn't tell you who applied and didn't receive funding. So it's hard to talk about that, um, comparing the success rate when you don't know um, who didn't get funding. And so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we were able to get around that problem. And so this database is, is, is fairly large. Um, and I had a, a, a great research assistant who helped me pull these data together. And so what I want to show you for the next couple of slides are some differences in funding by 1890 versus 1862. And sort of my earlier points were to talk about how there are these big um, how, how important funding can be and that there are some differentials. To be fair, when we originally started on this research, we wanted to actually look at the individual investigator level um, and we wanted to be able to identify whether the race of the individual. But the problem is NIFA doesn't collect these data or actually they do, but they don't keep it. So when you apply for a NIFA grant, there is a uh, investigator information sheet where you're able to talk about country of origin, uh, actually not country of origin, forgive me, um, race, gender, um, whether you were in the military, um, physical disability, there are some other factors. That information sheet uh, is collected by USDA, but it's stripped when it goes through the review process. And the argument is a valid one, which you don't want to do is um, keep uh, that information anyway connected to the proposal, therefore biasing um, reviewers. But the unfortunate part is that they don't reconnect it later. So if you wanted to see differences as NIH people studied NIH, you can't go back and reconnect it, or at least it's not readily available. So there's some there's some data limitations in being able to do this work. So the closest we were able to do was to look at the distinction between different institution types to see if it tells us something about how funding looks. And this graph right here shows us in deflated terms, the funding of in a, a NIFA funding um, by the institution types. And I should make one distinction, 1890, um, excuse me, 
other institutions, which is in orange in the graph, represent basically private institutions. Duke would be considered an other institution. It would include historical black colleges that are not 1890s, and it would also include um, just any other school that's not in the 1890, 1890 or 1862 system. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yes, it is just the lead institution. And I'm so glad you asked because it is difficult it, from looking at the data uh, gateway to figure out who are the subcontracts. So this is a really important point because 1890s may be, and vice versa, uh, 1890s may be a subcontract or provide a subcontract to a 1862. And we can't figure that out from these data. Um, but we could imagine, I would argue, that the lead institution is the one that typically gets the largest cut of the money and um, is, if they're the lead institution, they should be directing the work. So it does provide us some information, but you're exactly right. It doesn't tell us the full funding picture. The thing that we can see here is that there's some uh, pretty big jumps and movements in the funding. I will say the 2011 year looks particularly odd. And um, talking with Robin Shoemaker um, when he was still at NIFA, he explained that what happened was that there was a double funding in that year. So two years were basically combined in 2011. So that's why it looks substantially larger than the others. I think the key thing to, to keep in mind here is we shouldn't be surprised that 1862s have the largest share of the funding. That makes sense. They're the largest share of the land grant institutions. One of the things I think is particularly interesting is the growing um, importance of the other institutions. So non land grants are getting more and uh, getting a, a, a bigger chunk of the land grant, um, the MIFA funding, I should say it that way. The other thing that's important, and this is going to be borne out later. If you notice the thin gray line that gets really thin and gets kind of thick and then gets thin again and gets thick again are the 1890 institutions. That variability, I think, really is important. And we're going to see that uh, a little bit more in a second. So it's tough to look at sort of aggregate average funding and because of the difference in these different institutions and how many they are. And, and the reality is there are difference, differences in even in the sizes and the enrollment of these institutions. And so while we don't do a, a control for the size of the institution, we did do this one thing. We took the, the funding by these institution types and we looked at what was the average funding um, by institution. So we basically said, you know, take the number, divide it by the number of institutions. And what you would, what I would have thought would have been that there would have been some similarities across um, these institution types in terms of the average funding. Um, and what we see are there's some pretty big differences where um, the blue line here represents all institutions. So this is average funding. And we can see again that there's this gap between 1890s and 1862s, but there are some Surprising things, if you look at uh, 2013 and 2019, 1890s actually really get this big um, uh, uh, amount of cash. And it comes through um, a uh, extension facility program. And I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Um, it was instituted and it comes in um, twice. Um, and they're, they're related these two years. But if those two programs hadn't been there, you can see that in 2010 to 2012, and then um, 2014 to 2018, 1890s are substantially uh, lower in terms of average dollars. But one of the things I think that's really um, important, I've made reference to this. Again, I tried to keep the colors the same. What we look at is the coefficient of variation. It's sort of like the average funding divided by the standard deviation. It's a, it's a sort of a measurement of variability. And what I think is important to see is that the gray line, which represent the gray lines represent 1890 institutions, are substantially larger almost every year except for one than their 1862 and other partners. That's to say that the very, there is greater variability of funding that 1890s are receiving relative to other institutions. Now, I'm not saying why or how that occurs. My whole some, my whole point is this variability is important. If we think about it in a a kind of a portfolio sense that there's less stability in what that funding looks like over time. Um, I have a few more graphs and I'll, I'll be done. What I'm showing here is um, a measurement of diversity. So um, the NIFA, had, NIFA has a sort of a portfolio of 
programs that universities and colleges can apply to. And in any given year, there's about 43 different programs that the university can apply to. And what we see and what this graph represents is higher numbers represent greater diversity of funding sources. Now, this is grants that were funded. And so we can see that 1862 and other institutions have a greater variability of funding sources in the NIFA program. They're applying to different types of programs. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the other is not a stable set of schools. So Duke may apply one year, uh, Augusta State may apply another year. It's not like it's the same group of schools applying all the time. What's more comparable is the 1862 and 1890 because except for um, Central State, those schools have been the same over the time period. And so we can see that 1890s um, have more, very, uh, excuse me, less um, variability in terms of the different types of programs that they apply to. All right, I'll, I'll, I'm, a, I'm gonna show you two more graphs and I'll, I'll sit down. The, this is an opportunity that we were really lucky to have. We were working with Robin and we were able to get access to um, something that's kind of um, um, difficult to access. And it's, we were able to get a really stripped out um, indication of schools that applied for funding under the different um, agricultural economics and rural communities programs. And we knew whether or not they received funding. Again, the earlier database I told you is only of the winners. What we now are looking at are um, as a way of looking at if a school applied and whether or not they received the funding. And we also know how much funding they received. So we don't know the individual PIs. Um, so an institution may have multiple people apply for a grant, but we don't know who they are. We don't even know what the project was, but what we do know is um, whether or not they applied. And so I wanna just help you with the, uh, the image. Um, so the bar graphs, um, the vertical bar graphs represent the number of applications. And by no surprise, 1862s are applying more than the other institutions. And you can tell that the 1890s, which is this middle gray line um, here, is actually relatively small compared to their 1890 partners, 1862 partners. And we can see even others are larger. Now, I should note that this is the small farms program. And this is the program that 1890s actually do really well in. And they actually apply to this program more than any of the other programs. And one of the ways that you can see that they do well is if you look at the gray uh, line at the top, this is related to um, the success rate of applications. And you can see that in some years, the success rate was as low as 25% or 22%. And in 2019, um, they everyone who applied received a grant. So the small grants program, small farms program is a real success program for 1890s. 1862s don't do as well in this program as their 1890 partners because we can see the gap here between the gray and the red representing a lower success rate. Now, it is important to remember that 1862s are applying, there are more of them applying, so it's not surprising, but the success rate is an important thing. It is interesting to see others are actually applying, others that is non-land grant apply to this program, and they have moderate success here. I think the, this is the economics, market, and trade. So if you talk about the grant programs under NIFA, under um, the Ag Econ, this is, if you will, the more traditional Ag Econ program that you'd see folks here with this kind of funding. And you can see the success rate is lower across the board. But one of the things that's important to note is that 1890s, I think there were, out of the, out of the five years, three applications. 1890s are just not applying to this program. And their success rate um, actually also reflects, that's why you can see it completely down to zero. And then this year, the reason why there's a, a success a little bit is because I think one of those applications was actually a uh, conference grant. Um, and then we can see the success rate of the other institution types. I'll just make one more of these. And this is the rural development. And the reason why I brought these up is um, small farms, 1890s do well in. Um, economics, markets, and trade is sort of the traditional program. And rural economic development is one where most of these 1890s are actually located in rural communities. And you can see again that 1890s um, aren't applying. And when they do apply, they're having some moderate 
but 1862s aren't doing uh, aren't really super successful in this program either but they're doing better than others so i'll just end by saying um that we know that there's some differences in these funding um streams and we just need to ask some questions about what does this split in funding really mean i, I think the the thing i've learned out of this work is that 1890s um have lower funding on a on a per grant basis um it's more fun uh more variable and they're not as diversified. And, and, and in some instances, at least in the AggieCon um, rural, de rural development space, they're not applying at quite the same rate. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. But there are a lot of different factors that may limit uh, an institution for applying. So I'll, I'll stop there um, and thank you. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I wonder if it's not coincidental that in that same period that there were high funds, we saw flat land holdings go down in that scope. And, yeah. Um, so I apologize for the extension to the So I guess I'm curious because I'm assuming 1890s would have got some equivalent to that grant funding or had that DHS the money, but obviously it was not the same as the federal grant. Yeah. Um, so if I'm a faculty, I'm not an Alabama a and That's a good question. And to be honest, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I'm going to look at other folks in the room if you all know what it was like to get funding before 77. I, I, my impression was it just wasn't there. But I, 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 my impression, I'll say it this way. From some of the things I've been reading, it looks like the state could or there could be some way of sharing it. But I, I don't know how it was shared or what were arrangements that took place to make it happen. I at least know with extension funds, it was maybe up to the state on the other side, so a portion of it was mm. um, And usually it was again in segregation south, which is why you could only go to the extension service and the oh. state. Right. It's incredibly clear and it should be at a time when agriculture was mechanizing and yeah. there was obviously government support coming from the state. Yeah, there, there, so, yeah. Yeah, Kim Rick. The multi-state projects? The, where you can actually, well, the 1860 extend um, an 1890s partner to look at regional um, questions. Oh. Was there any, did you discover anything in that? Or is it no. something to be I, I would imagine that's capacity because it sounds like multi-state, but I'm not as I'm not as familiar with that. But I didn't even know that. Maybe, I mean, I've, I've recently discovered that in the regional project, they're tendering something uh, to Oh, that's fascinating. But they're very, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's I know them kind of thing. Yeah. And how do you get that? I'm sure the 1890 research directors would have more sure. insight on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And you know, I I wanted to make a quick comment about your question too uh, about you know the pre nineteen seventy seven time period. And I remember reading in this book I was talking about earlier, Dispossessed, that, that there it was African Americans could have a position at a 1862 land grant in the extension system but it was sort of it was and it was to serve those purposes it seemed like it had to kind of go through depending on the state i think it had to kind of go through the 1862 so there was some sharing but it wasn't it's a bit murky and i think there's something really important to, to explore there because clearly something was happening but exactly how it was done 
I have a feeling from this conversation, it probably was haphazard. There was, you know, different states did it differently. Yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of heterogeneity there. And, you know, even the rules from what I've read, and I must admit, I, I got a little lost in it. Some of the rules about how that fun, formula funding works is so murky. And it looks like it's different for the 1890s versus 1862. It's not like they just copied the, the Hatch Act and made it the Evans Allen. It, they put in other rules and other restrictions. And so. But. Mm. Even though it's 1862, it's far from a project management. Uh -huh. Any of all that, uh, those projects have, or even any other university project yeah. that some you know, human capital nightmare. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. So, I don't know. That's something I've been fighting. Yeah, I will say that, I mean, you raise an interesting point, and, and because you mentioned this earlier, the what does it mean to collaborate across institutions and just the institutional infrastructure is super complicated. And you know, I know with the AggieCon rule, um, rule economy program, they bumped up the sort of uh, maximum limit from 500,000 to 650,000. And, and so it's, it, it looks like a greater opportunity, but um, as the saying goes, more money, more problems. And it can be a challenge of like, how do we navigate that appropriately? I don't know about the most recent um, bump up beyond that part. And so I'd be interested to, to learn more and to see how this goes. I will admit some of my work is thinking more in the historical sense, but I, obviously this is an evolving space. And I know that the, the current administration is moving in some ways in this direction and trying to keep track of that is going to be critical. So thank you for, for raising that point. Sure. No, I mean, you can, it, even with the, the demographic information strip, you still know who the person is. So if you wanted to figure out who the person is, you can do it um, because there are letters in there uh, that can be letters and other things. So it's not that you don't know who the researcher is. You don't know necessarily anything about them, but oh, go yeah, ahead. I was going to say, uh, even, even on a website, I think the most people have come across, even that cover sheet, it, it, they check mark uh, the most of them. Yeah. So I, I think you can take the contact because we have so many different roles. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you would have to go back and manually. Yeah, and that's it. And then making determinations of someone's identity is also murky and messy at best. So you just, it's its difficult. It is interesting that NIH and NSF, as I understand it, you can do that, or at least there's there's a mechanism that allows people to figure out that data. So um, there is interest. I mean, even understand the gender of applicants. There were some people who were trying to do that work with NIFA data. And they just weren't able to make a distinction what's going on, even in terms of gender. So. Are there any 